Uh, good morning, everyone, and can I welcome you to the 18th meeting of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone, please turn off their mobile phones as it interferes with the recording uh, system. I have apologies from Polly McNeill, MSP, and Alison Johnson, MSP. Our uh, first item in Agenda 1 is to continuation of our evidence session in the Social Security Committee. And we have two panels this morning, and our first panel, uh, can I welcome... Um, Paul Smith, Member of Administrative Justice Committee, Law Society of Scotland, David Semple, PCS Chair of Scotland Committee, PCS Union, and Nicola Dickey, Policy Manager, COSLA. I'll kick off with the first question, and it's quite a general question and open up afterwards for uh, other members. In previous sessions, we have asked our witnesses uh, for their views on the principles and proposed charter. Can you perhaps tell us what your views are and what way, if any, you perceive or think uh, the principles and the proposed charter will have on influencing the organisational uh, culture of the new agency? Um, Paul Smith. Good morning. Um, the Law Society um, warmly welcomed um, the fact that the principles surrounding the book surrounding the new social security arrangements in Scotland had been placed on the face of the bill. Um, supplementary, supplemented by the further information in the Charter, uh, we feel that this will lead to a fairer, more just social security system than currently exists. We, we would have liked to have seen also in the principles um, the additional point about preserving the integrity of social security in the new system in Scotland. Um, but other than that, we, we warmly welcome them. We also think they will probably help foster a better, more mutually respective uh, relationship between agency staff and the customers that they will deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you very much. You want Nicola? I mean, Cosler remains supportive of the principles and the approach that's been taken around about devolved social security to date. So the principle of social security as a human right is one which local government recognises as important, and we note the Scottish Human Rights Commission's narrative around the key elements. So things around about things like availability, adequacy, accessibility and affordability of social security will all have to be determined and evaluated so that um, social security as a human right is genuinely um, born out of that. Um, we're also supportive of Scottish ministers ensuring that individuals are given what they are eligible for um, and we think that's really positive that that is on the face of the bill. It will go some way to assisting individuals claim their full entitlement, which is something that local government has it is actively involved in making sure that everyone claims um, what they're entitled to from the various elements of social security. Um, from, from our perspective, our membership were um, pointing to the fact that that could be strengthened perhaps by um, making the principle a bit stronger around about access to independent advice and support to do that. Um, so, so what we know from our work with um, the most vulnerable in our communities on the ground is that those who need the most help are the ones who are the least likely to claim what they're eligible for. So I think that's that's one of the things that moving forward local government would be interested in just kind of strengthening and expanding. Thank you. Uh, David said. A bit like my colleagues, um, PCS very much welcome the inclusion of the uh, principles into the face of the bill. I think for us, though, the, the key issue is not so much the principles where there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of disagreement between ourselves and the ministers. It's about how things are actually implemented. So whilst we welcome many of the things about the bill, the commitment to a face-to-face -face service and the dignity and respect that can provide, the uh, plans for the determination without application, which goes back to the good old days, if you like, from the perspective of colleagues who work in DWP of the pensions local service and benefit uptake work, the positive face of social security and the open-handed way that the Minister and Social Security uh, Agency colleagues have worked with the Union to, to bring forward implementation. I think there are a range of ways throughout the Bill that we could have given better impact to those principles, and I'll just mention a couple of them. 
to uh, commit in the bill to the exclusion of private providers, I think, is one of the key issues. I, I don't think I, I need to tell committee members about the impact private providers have had in uh, reserved benefits and in the uh, destruction of the reputation of the Department for Work and Pensions. The commitment, we would also welcome the, uh, if the commitment to uh, annual operating of benefits was included in the bill. This has been a significant um, move by the Westminster government, obviously, in, in decoupling that and in stopping the annual operating in line with uh, RPI and otherwise inflation. The other things that we would call for would include the commitment to mitigate sanctions using the, uh, the, the short-term assistance that's included in the bill, mm -hmm. uh, the commitment to vigorous scrutiny, and I, I know, having spoken to the Minister, that she's far from opposed to that, and I suppose it's for committee members to decide how best to uh, give force to that kind of scrutiny, and lastly, to commit to all devolved benefits having a payment pending appeal process, which is a step beyond what the bill includes at the minute. At the minute the bill allows for short-term assistance, we would argue that it should go back to pre-2012, pre-Welfare Reform Act of there being a system of claimants continuing to receive the benefit until they have their appeal if there is a decision made against them. So all of these would give force, much greater force, we argue, to the principles which we do broadly welcome. Um, thank, you, thank you very much, and we'll certainly be investigating that with, with other members will be asking various questions. I was interested in, uh, Mr Smith, and you regarded, uh, regarding the Charter would foster a better relationship between, obviously, the clients, the customers, whatever you want to call it, because, obviously, we know there are charters and other public service bodies, health board, etc. I'm not sure if there is any in the DWP. So could you maybe elaborate on what you meant by foster better relationships? Uh, is the charter actually better than charters that we have just now in other public bodies? And maybe perhaps the other witnesses might like to say something about that. Um, I think that the basis for the point that I made was that over time, as the administration of benefits has become more centralised and taken out of the local, the local area, face-to-face -face relationship between the, the DWP staff and the clients that they deal with has become ever wider. The gap um, has, has grown over the years with the result that the relationship between them is largely now dealt with um, by post, uh, by telephone, by email. Um, and, and that has led, I think, um, as, as David uh, suggested in his response to a breakdown in the relationship between staff and clientele. Um, I think that, that that's something that needs to be fixed. Um, at the moment, I think it, it wouldn't be overstating the position to suggest that there is um, a sort of relationship based on mutual distrust whereas you want to turn that round so that there is a, a mutually trusting relationship between the staff and the clients that they deal with. And there will be a good deal of work needed to bring that situation about by way of um, customer service training, as well as the other kind of training that, that staff will need. Thank you. Did you want to come in, Mr Semple, on that, or Nicola? I absolutely agree with what Paul just said. I think if we want to talk about distrust, we can't have that conversation without talking about sanctions and the fact that they were the, the thing that began that uh, distrust between claimants and the staff who have always been there and believed it their job to support those claimants. Mm -hmm. Nicola Dickey, did you want to give it a I, mean, I, don't, I don't disagree with anything that anyone's already said. I mean, COSLA welcomes the intention around about the Charter. Um, Anything that can um, foster a good relationship between the most vulnerable in our society and those charged with helping them claim social security seems like a good thing. I suppose in conversations with local government officers, they've been clear that the charter should be a two-way process, so it should have rights and responsibilities, mm -hmm. and that's the way to perhaps breathe life into that. So staff of the agency don't see it as something to kind of beat them over the head with. It's the opposite. It's a contract between them and the people that they are serving. So something that has lots of plain English language in it, something that's actually usable, something that we can display and that people can, can buy into the ethos on on kind of both sides of the table, if you like, those claiming the assistance and those helping with the assistance. So I think there's a real opportunity for us to do that. And I think it's helpful that um, the bill commits the ministers to um, 
developing that charter and in, in, in co-production with those who will be using the charter. I suppose we would um, emphasise that there's an awful lot of experience across the public sector landscape in Scotland and not only those claiming the benefits or those charged with giving out the benefits should be involved in that conversation. All of the public sector landscape should be bringing what they know about um, relationships with customers um, to, to the forefront on that. So we're absolutely in agreement and we are stand ready to help um, from a local government perspective. Thank you very much. Certainly that's what I got when I was speaking to staff and obviously uh, claimants as well in, in job centres, etc. They don't technically call them job centres now, but uh, you get the drift of that anyway. Ben McPherson, do you want to come in a supplementary on that one? Y yes, please. Yeah, okay, yeah. and then Adam Tompkins. Thank, thank you. It's just a, a, a supplementary for, for Paul Smith. Um, and just for clarity and transparency, convener, I'm no longer a non-practicing member of the Law Society of Scotland, but I am still in the role of Scottish listers. Um, I thought it was really interesting the point you made about the principles about general acceptance and agreement. Uh, your proposal for ensuring the integrity of the system is a, a suggestion that's not been made elsewhere, and I just wondered if you would like to elaborate on, on what exactly you mean by that and why you think it's important. Well, I, I think it, it goes back to the rights and responsibilities question again, that as well as ensuring that everybody who is entitled to benefit actually goes on to receive it, it's also important to recognise um, the inherent risk um, through fraud and overpayments that over the years has led the um, Auditor General to refuse to sign off the DWP's accounts because of the unacceptable high level of fraud that, that is in the system. And I think the majority of the rest of the, the principles on the face of the bill were all um, relating to how, how we make the system better for um, the user. Um, the Law Society felt that there was also a need to recognise uh, the risk to um, expenditure in the taxpayer. Thanks for clarifying that. Thank you. <laughs> Ruth Maguire, tell you something. Again. Thank you, Convener. Is it not the case, though, that fraud, actual fraud, makes up a tiny, tiny percentage of the the mistakes? That actually the, the bigger amount of that is um, administrative errors. I just wouldn't want to give the impression yes. that. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I think I think the figure is around three percent mm -hmm. of overall expenditure, which, as you say, is is a very small amount. Um, but it is concerning mm. that the, the Auditor General won't, sure. won't sign off the accounts because of that. Yeah, thank you. David Semple. Thank you. <coughs> Just to uh, sort of add to the point that uh, Ms McGuire was making there, I think we also have to take into account the amount of benefit underpayment in the system at the minute, which mm -hmm. runs to billions of pounds as well. So. Thank you very much for that. Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank, thank you, Convener. I wanted to ask the panel two, two different questions, but before I do, can I just pick up on something that Mr Semple said in his uh, earlier remark? Um, and and I, I saw in the um, PS, PCS's written evidence that you're very strongly opposed to the involvement of the private sector in um, uh, processing DLA PIP. Are you, is the union equally opposed to the use of the private sector in the delivery of devolved employability services? Yes, I think we are, and we have spoken about this with the Minister and with the um, implementation colleagues involved in the employability work. I mean, to, to give some context to that, I want to be clear that our opposition is not what you might argue is purely ideological. It's based on performance, mm -hmm. and in terms of employability, all of the privatised employability contracts, they have never had the uh, delivery outcomes that we've seen from the previous state-run programmes. Mm -hmm. So if you use things like the... Um, <coughs> The, the New Deal, going back a little way to the um, previous, well, two previous governments ago, its outcomes in terms of finding people employment were, I think, 0.5% higher than the equivalent in the private sector. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, the first question I want to ask the, the whole of the panel is about the structure of the bill, really, and, the, and in particular about the relationship in the bill between what's proposed to be in primary legislation in the bill itself and what's proposed to be made by uh, regulations um, thereafter. Um, last week, uh, this committee heard from, a, uh, I think, eight uh, witnesses, um, and the note that we've got from the clerk says that there was, amongst those groups, a universal view 
that the balance in the bill between primary and secondary, secondary legislation is not right. Um, do you agree with that? And if you do agree with it, what do you think should be in the bill that isn't in the bill? Um, as you'll see from the Law Society's response, um, we, we didn't have any particular strong issue around this area. Um, but having seen the responses um, from people who have submitted to the committee, um, I think the key, the key issue for, for me um, would relate to the need for some sort of independent oversight of the system. Many people advocate um, on the face of the bill um, a body such as the Social Security Advisory Committee and um, I, I think that is indeed a good idea, whether it be a body that looks like SAC or a, a better body um, as, as Scottish ministers decide. Um, I think the general view is that um, any, anything that is on the face of the bill thereafter becomes difficult to change, whereas anything that is in secondary legislation can be changed. But um, at the same time, I do recognise um, others' concerns around um, the scrutiny of secondary legislation. And um, maybe that is an issue that needs to be considered further. Can, can I just clarify? I mean, I'm, I'm sure we'll come to questions of um, uh, um, <coughs> advice and scrutiny in, in, in due course. Um, but my, perhaps I didn't ask my question very clearly. What I'm, what I'm interested in in particular is whether the um, rules for the el eligibility and operation of the devolved benefits are appropriately left to secondary legislation as the bill currently proposes, or whether they should replicate whether we should replicate existing UK legislation and have much more by way of detail of eligibility and operation of the particular benefits in, in the legislation itself so that we can scrutinise it uh, as this bill goes forward. Sorry, that, I, I should probably have made that clear. I, all, I, all I'd like to respond to that is that I, I would need to stick by what the Law Society has said in its response, that the current level of detail in the bill, in, in our view, is more or less right. Well... <clears throat> Broadly speaking, the balance between the two is right. I mean, that's not to say that there aren't other things that we think should be included in the face of the bill. I, I think I mentioned already the idea of uprating of benefits, which I presume would be included in the secondary legislation um, whenever the regulations are actually devised to look at that. I would prefer, obviously, that it to be stated up front in the primary legislation. There are a number of other things that we would al also want to be included in the the process for uh, mandatory redetermination is obviously a controversial one and we would argue that it too closely replicates what's included in the Westminster, the, the, the reserved benefits and that there should be changes to that made to the bill as it currently stands but in general as I say the balance between the two is fine. Thank you. Nicola Dickey. I mean I suppose from a from a local government perspective we, we, we kind of understand the rationale for um, much of the the nuts and bolts, if you like, coming in the secondary legislation. That said, um, I, I agree with David, there are some things that, if they are consistently going to be applied across the whole of devolved social security, so things like uprating, things like residency requirements, um, these were things that we were quite surprised um, weren't on the face mm. of the bill. And I suppose um, another one for me is backdating. So we know that when universal credit was introduced, <laughs> um, full swoop backdating effectively went from something that was, was, was quite long to a month. So I suppose it's, it's things like that we would um, see some benefit in putting onto the, on, onto the primary um, legislation. That's not to say that um, we, we don't understand the reasoning behind putting some stuff in secondary, but the other thing for us is if the parliamentary process takes three or four years to scrutinise this, you may well end up with backdating in one benefit being entirely different to backdating in another benefit, just by the way the parliamentary process works. Um, the Scottish Government have been clear that devolved social security is an opportunity to simplify the system. Um, that might look a lot less like simplification mm -hmm. if, if that's the way that was to pan out. So, so I think those are the things moving forward that are worth another pass at, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you very much. My, sec my second question is um, about the power to create new benefits. Um, and we know that um, the bill includes in uh, section 45 um, a provision for the top-up power. 
but there is no section in the bill um, that enables Scottish ministers to create new benefits. Is that an omission which, you, in your view, should be uh, rectified, or is that, um, is that okay? Who wants to come in on that particular one? Paul Smith? I, I personally, and, and I don't think the Law Society has a strong view on that, I'm afraid. Um, that's, that's fine. David Sim. Thank you. The, we undertook a huge degree of consultation with members in the Department for Work and Pensions to discuss precisely these kinds of issues. Now, I think a lot of our members hark back to different benefits to the ones that currently exist, and I think some of them have argued that there have been benefits to those um, benefits, I suppose, advantages, I should say, to those benefits, uh, to avoid repeating myself. So, we, there arguably any area that's not covered, you could say, yes, there should be a space for the Scottish ministers to enact a new benefit, but that's surely something that would need to come back to the Parliament for further discussion, scrutiny, public consultation and so forth. So. Nicola Dickey. I, I don't disagree with what David said okay. there. It's, it, it's not there, but in, in the grand scheme of things, I think moving forward, it may be something that is worth another look. But safe and secure transfer is, is mm. what we're hearing is far more important than having a conversation in and around about new benefits. It's more about how can we land what, what we're getting, certainly from, from those supporting um, vulnerable customers on the ground. That's what's exercising their mind on it. Uh, Paul Smith. Sorry, I've, I, I've had a further thought listening, listening to colleagues here. Um, obviously, we're, we're talking today about a system which hasn't yet fully been devolved and um, I assume that in the fullness of time, um, with, with greater devolution powers being passed from the UK to the Scottish Government, um, it's not too difficult to envisage a time in hopefully the near future that Social Security is devolved entirely to um, the Scottish Parliament, which makes me think that it might be helpful um, to include on the face of the Bill of Power um, to create new benefits that suit the needs of Scottish people. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. But certainly we hear on the ground in the committee from the evidence that they want the transition at the moment, you know, as long as it goes smoothly uh, for, for the people who are actually accessing it. That is, is very important. Jeremy Balfour, did you wish to... I did, thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to go to two points, if that's OK. Um, we've had quite a lot of submissions and discussions on independent advice and how that should work and um, what should that be in the bill uh, and if so what kind of provisions should be made so I wonder what, what your views on that is is it and how should it be funded um, should there be a special um, government grant should it be similar to the legal aid system that we have at the moment and, and I wonder whether you had any views around that and the second question is really kind of probably aimed specifically, specifically at David just going back to the use of public private sector organisations presumably we all agree what we want is the, the, the best service for the claimant that is possible and now there may well be debate whether that is happening or not happening at the moment but in principle why could a private company, if they trained their staff properly and had the proper accountability, not be able to do that, as well as somebody from a public sector? Is it simply because they are private that you're opposed to it? Or what, what is the... And I appreciate I'm not saying that the scheme at the moment is, is working, but what I'm saying is that if, if, if it could be shown that a private company could do it, as well as a, a public sector organisation, why would you be opposed to that? If that makes sense. But my more question is more around the advocacy, which I'm interested in to you a bit more about. David Semple, do you want to go in there? Thanks, ma'am. Uh, the answer to the second question first, just to get the specific side of the way, I suppose I don't believe and no evidence has ever shown me or any of my colleagues across the union that private sector can deliver what the public sector can deliver. And I suppose I would argue that it's down to motivation. The motivation of the private sector is to extract the maximum amount of money from their contract as profit 
whereas the motivation of the public sector is always to deliver the quality service. Now, whether you look at the delivery of telephone services within DWP, some of which are privatised, for example, we have JSA telephone lines which are privatised to Capita, whether you look at employability contracts, whether you look at the healthcare providers, the, the, health, the HCPs when they claim for PIPs and so on and so forth, the quality continually comes back as an issue. And it's continually about <coughs> staffing, the investment in staff training, and so on and so forth. It's never to the same standard as DWP, which is why repeatedly and routinely on all private contracts, DWP staff wind up having to be moved across to the private sector providers to support their delivery because they can't do it themselves. And I think that is down to their profit motive as opposed to their public service motives. If, to respond to the, to the more general point in terms of independent advice, I don't think that we have uh, particularly strong views. I think what we would say, and without in any way denigrating the excellent work many of our colleagues do in the independent advice and guidance sector, is that the reason that that is required these days is because of sanctions and the distrust between DWP staff and claimants. If there was no sanctions regime, they could get that advice from us. They could get it from DWP staff. And so we would argue that Bearing in mind, we, we uh, think that there should be a purely public delivery of a lot of these services, that that would be the ideal way to go forward in the fullness of time where all of these services are delivered at one point by a public sector service. But if I could just go back, I mean, if you go back 20 years ago to when DLA was introduced as a new benefit, there was still as much representation at tribunals from end of the old DLA as there was in PIP, in fact, probably more. So, do you, are you saying that people don't need independent advice under this new system if we get it right? David Simple. Thank you. No, sir. I mean, the, obviously, we would want people to have every opportunity for as much advice as possible, and there is definitely a role in that for the independent sector. But for even for, for many of the smaller things, I think you would find that they wouldn't need to go to ask about eligibility rules and how to actually claim a benefit and things like that because they wouldn't be afraid to walk into whatever the Scottish equivalent of a job centre would be and get exactly that advice. If I can go back a few years ago, it used to be the case that claimants would come in with no idea about what they were eligible for or what to claim, and a member of staff would sit with them and fill in the claim form. Now, that was 40,000 job cuts ago. If we could get back to a properly staffed public service, it's that level of support that people could get from it. That's not to take away from the role of an independent sector in terms of tribunal representation and so forth, because obviously they're appealing against decisions made by our staff in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. George Adams, do you want to come in as supplementary before the other witnesses come in? Okay, on that, is, uh, is this not back to what we were discussing earlier on? Oh, sorry, I forgot to say morning. Uh, the, but the fact that... Uh, I think Paul Smith said there's currently a, a culture of mistrust between claimant and DWP, but it's not the case that, we're, that the bill, as it is and what's trying to be achieved, is to create the type of uh, uh, atmosphere that uh, David Temple's already talking about, where the claimant will actually get the opportunity to, at that level to sort things out. And also can I add with that as well, with advice as well, local authorities currently already have, I know as a former councillor myself, uh, have a duty to ensure that people have access to uh, that type of advice. And it would it not be the case that if it was on the face of the bill, then you would almost be centralising that and then you come back centralising independent advice to a certain degree and you have a situation where you have the old uh, how do local communities, the rural, urban idea, how do you deliver it and was local government not in the best place to actually continue with these types of advice services they have. So it's a kind of two-sided uh, two uh, question but it's the same thing about the whole independent uh, advice. Nicola Dickie, do you want to come in on that one because I know they mentioned yeah. local government there. I mean, I, th I think from... From a local government perspective, regardless of how um, well we do in making the, the, the system much better for people to navigate, our belief would be that around about ensuring access to Social Security as a human right, people have to be able to access independent advice. Um, with the best will in the world, and I agree with what David said, if we design good processes, people will not necessarily have to seek out the help of advice agencies to fill in a form, perhaps, that they do at the moment. Um, people may, be, may be, be able to, through whatever means they find accessible to them, navigate the system themselves. But there will, become a, there will become a point, regardless of the way we set up the agency, where people 
have to be told, no, I'm sorry, you don't, you're not entitled or you don't qualify. And at that point, that person surely has the right to step outside and be given independent access to um, advice and support. And the point that um, Mr Adam makes is right. Local government does have internal welfare rights teams. In, in recent years, we've moved those teams probably in the vast majority of local authorities more in towards the kind of social work kind of realm in terms of being advocates for, for the customer on their, their kind of own on behalf. So I think fr from our perspective, how we do it in terms of should, should Scottish ministers allow local government to commission that support locally, that's a different conversation about how we go about it. But I suppose um, our principle would be that if the agency is coming in and they expect that people w will, will require advice and advocacy, then somebody has to be paying for that. And, um, the advice and advocacy projects that are running on the ground in Scotland, I'm sure some of you have visited them, are not without queues of people accessing them. Mm. So I think we just have to be aware that, that, that there's two things at play here. In principle, do we think people accessing devolved social security will need independent advice and support? I think local government would say yes, they do. Then there's a conversation about what's the best way to deliver that. And local government's take on that should be that it would be those who are closest to the communities who are in the best mm. place to decide how and when that advice and support should be provided. Mm. Paul Smith, did you want to come in on both yes, questions? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, first of all, I agree entirely with everything that Nicola and David have said. Over the years, um, and especially probably in the last 20 years, the, the local advice sector has been squeezed year on year with the result that um, they, pr they probably are struggling to meet the demand that is being placed on their services. However, it is heartening to see the Minister's announcement about providing better face-to-face -face contact with clientele right at the very beginning of the claim. Because I think if you get things right from the beginning, then you're left with fewer cases at the end that still need problems to be resolved. Um, we, al we already have a fairly well-established network of um, advice givers across Scotland. Um, perhaps we need to look at how better they, they, might be, they might be coordinated. We also need to look at how their services are funded um, and, and think about what, what kind of demand is likely to continue to be coming to their doors once the new arrangements are fully in place. On the question of independent advice, um, Mr Balfour also mentioned the question of legal aid. Um, well, as, as the committee probably already knows, there is, there is currently no provision for legal aid to take an appeal to the first tier tribunal or indeed the upper tribunal, unless a case is um, of such particular complexity that the upper tribunal judge um, suggests that legal aid should be provided, but that, that is the exception to the rule. Um, tribunals were never intended to be overly formal um, forums for decisions. They were meant to be informal, they were meant to be quick, um, they were meant to be relatively cheap compared to the courts. But as we all know, over the years, um, law, law becomes more complicated and in reality, people do need legal advice. Thank you. David Seymour, did you want to come in? And I know that Ruth McGuire <coughs> wanted to come in and suck on that one. And then I'll get... Just in response to Mr Adams' point, um, I, I don't disagree that uh, colleagues in welfare rights organisations across local authorities have an important role to play in the system in terms of delivering to both rural and urban communities. I think we welcome the commitment expressed by the Minister to have a presence across communities in Scotland and a face-to-face -face service that the new Social Security Agency will be able to interact with claimants like that. Uh, whether that involves having their own premises being co-located in local authority premises and so on, that's really for that, that's a discussion about resources rather than about the principle which we support. Thank you, Ruth McGuire. You wanted to come in a supplementary. Yeah, um, I just wanted to tease out a little bit. Quite often, when we say independent advice and advocacy, I think what's brought to mind is a organisation 
elsewhere that comes in. But we heard last week that advocacy that's kind of informal and sought out by the, the person who's entitled to the benefits is actually equally as powerful. And is it maybe the case that if we, I think David touched on it, if we change the, the relationship that the agency has with people who are entitled to the benefits, that actually we can be just as effective. And if we get it right, the need for um, people coming in, and one thing I was um, struck by was a local authority um, worker who said to me that we used to do income maximisation, now it's income defence work we're doing. That actually, if we get that the, the agency relationship right, and we have the people in there who are um, empowered to maximise people's, um, what they're entitled to, um, that the need for the, the formal bit of that will, will, will reduce. Uh, do you want, David Semper, do you want to come back first? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I th think that's the, we discussed earlier getting the culture of the organisation right, and I think that has to be, that is absolutely crucial. What I would say about culture is that with the best will in the world, I mean, new staff into DWP are inducted in the idea of eradicating poverty and so forth. It's all very well with words if you don't have the resources to actually deliver those outcomes. When it comes to things like staffing, so that you are not running around doing 15 cases when actually you should be doing three, because that's the appropriate number, and giving full support to the people involved, because they are people, they're not just numbers on a page for a lot of our staff. So I absolutely agree with what you just said, yeah. Did you want to come in, Paul Smith, and I think that's a point to come to? to add that, yes, it is, it is a culture, it's a mindset, and at the moment the emphasis appears to be on quantity rather than quality. And I think that emphasis needs to change. Yep. Nicola, please. Any other two, two colleagues? Um, I, I suppose for me, I'm going back to the principle of social security as a human right. And if the principle is that social security is a human right and we know people need help to access and therefore get their, their human right of social security. There's something for me around about the principle of providing access to independent advice. I absolutely take on board if we design good processes and we have a culture and we have an ethos around about doing things the way that Scotland wants them done, that will go some way to um, dealing with the kind of lower level form filling in, etc. And I think you're absolutely right, the point about local government um, has, it's a long time since local government was able to prioritise what we wanted to do in terms of income maximisation because we have dealt a long time with what is potentially service failure elsewhere in the public sector. But I think for me, it's, it's the two items. As, do we agree with the principle that to access people's human rights, they are going to need support to do that? And then the second part is if we agree that principle, then there are, there are a, a number of ways that we could, we could make that go forward. And I think all of those things will be relevant, um, definitely. Thank, thank you. Mark Griffin, you wanted to come in this supplementary, but you wanted to come in another yep. question as well. Yep, thanks, Kimina. Uh, morning, morning, panel. It, it was on this issue of um, independent advocacy and advice and whether, if we can get the culture right, that people coming through that organisation um, wouldn't have as great a need for that. But um, if the culture is right at the beginning, that doesn't mean the culture will, will be right in perpetuity. We've, We've spoken about the system at the DWP where a political change has then led to a greater need for uh, independent advocacy and advice. And it may be that regardless of how well the agency is set up initially, that a change in government, um, a change in minister who sets a direction to reduce a benefits bill, who then charges the chief executive of the agency with um, altering the culture of his or her organisation, that there then does become a bigger need um, for independent advice um, and advocacy and whether um, to safeguard th that right, as you put it, that if we're safeguarding mm -hmm. social security as a human right, that we should be seen at the outset, um, regardless of what the culture of that organisation is going to be, that people have a right to independent advocacy uh, to make sure there is no um, abuse of state power, that the right of the individual is always protected. Um, and that we should be looking for that on the face of the bill. Does anybody want to go? I know you've answered a similar question to that. Does anybody want to come back on that particular one? Or? Okay. I'll make a wee point. Um, I agree that 
you know, a change of government, a change of priority can always change the culture of any organisation, but that is not just specific to the potential social security agency. Uh, it's also true of the organisations which have to deliver welfare rights. They have also been subject to cuts. I mean, the uh, legal aid budget cuts with the cuts to local authorities and so on have also driven uh, changes to those organisations where they don't have the resources to deal with the claimants as they would like. So. I think that the key priority is that everybody in the room is committed to properly funding the organisation as well as funding independent advice and guidance. I don't have, I don't have a horse in the race about should it be enshrined into the face of the bill, but I think that the idea of that the culture might change, we, we should be absolutely setting everything in place at the start to make sure that the culture doesn't change, and that should be a key focus of the bill. Yep. Uh, Nicola. Uh, um, you spoke about a, a future, um, how things may change in the future. The bill as drafted at the moment includes a redetermination process. Um, I'm sure if you spoke to independent or local government um, welfare rights teams and advice teams, they'll tell you they spend an awful lot of their time helping people navigate the, mm -hmm. the current mandatory consideration process. So whilst we, we, we recognise and we are totally on board with the cultural change in the organisation, the bill is drafted at the moment does not do away with the fact that people may well still have to have an internal review by the Scottish Government or the agency and then move to, to another stage. So, so right away, we've already designed in part of um, the issues that we are already seeing significant spikes in the, in, in the services that we provide. So I think it's just, just kind of marrying up the two for us is what's, what's important as we move forward. There is a balance to be struck around about making the processes good and usable and people getting the right outcomes, but there is also that, that requirement that people will want to step away in the same way that they do very often from local government. People might not want to come to local government's welfare rights teams, they want to go independently, and that's why local government does a bit of both. We do what we do internally, but we also fund external because we recognise that people will want to, at some stage, step away from services that are provided by, by local government. Mm -hmm. About choice, and to, an, to an extent, really. Did you want to come back in that, Paul Smith? I'm further to add. Okay. Jenny Balfour, you want to come in a supplementary that then, Mark Griffin? Yeah, I, I, I was really kind of picking up Nicholas, but I mean, I think there's a danger here that we're getting ourselves to paint a picture that if we change the culture, if we change that, everybody's going to be really happy with it. And the presumption is that even whatever system you design, and however uh, friendly it is, some people will get an award and some people won't get an award. And I suppose my fear around this is unless we design the system that protects those that get turned down, but maybe still deserve it. And I, and I suppose, going back to David, is is that not then the role for independent advice? And there must be a difference between advice and representation. And I think we often use the words the same. There is a difference between getting advice when you go in early and then getting representation at whatever level you need that. So I, I'm just slightly concerned that we think if we redesign everything, everybody's going to get an award. And clearly that's not going to be the case. There are going to be people who don't get it. And it's how we look after those individuals. Does any of the panel want to come back on that particular one, Paul Smith? I, I think part of the problem at the moment um, stems from the kind of toxic relationship that, that currently exists between claimants and DWP staff. And another factor, I think, is that the current success rate, if you take a, a decision to an appeal tribunal, is running at 63% for ESA and PIP appeals. Now, as, as long as that is the success rate, um, people will be distrustful of the decisions that are made within the DWP. Um, so, so there is also an issue around how do you improve decision making? Why are so many, given, given that mandatory reconsideration was meant to um, enable the, the, the DWP to get their decisions right or correct them at the earliest opportunity, why then is the appeal success rate not reducing? And also, why, why is the percentage of mandatory reconsiderations that are successful in the claimant's favour, why is that only running at 13%? Um, these are all issues that, that are relative. Thank you. 
Does any panel want to come back on that particular one? Okay. Uh, Mark Griffin, you want to come back? Yep, thanks, Kavina. I wanted to ask about the new offences that are created in the bill um, around about um, offences on information an applicant may provide. Um, if, those, if that information is wrong. Um, the current um, DWP system is that the prosecution has to prove um, dishonesty in the application to prosecute, whereas the system proposed here in Scotland from the evidence that we've received is that there would be no, there is no bar, there is no um, requirement for a prosecution to prove dishonesty, um, that uh, an honest mistake made by an applicant could result in a criminal prosecution. Just to ask what the, the panel's view of the legislation has drafted, whether they agree uh, with the evidence that we've received on the new offences regime, and if you think any changes should be made. Um, Paul Smith. I, I, I think that's quite an unhealthy position um, to be, to be um, proposing that people are prosecuted for accidentally providing incorrect information. Um, I think there has to be some evidence of intention to um, defraud, and I think that would need to be the basis for any decision on which it's taken to prosecute someone. Anyone else in the panel want to come in on that one? David Semple. Yeah, completely agree with what Paul just said, is that if, as uh, Mr Griffin has just outlined, that is the situation in the bill, that you uh, have removed the obligation on the department to prove that there's dishonesty at the outset, then that's an unhelpful position. I work with uh, fraud officers and compliance officers, and they are very serious and specific about exactly that issue, about making sure that they can prove before referring to courts this issue of dishonesty. And off the back of that, many things are settled informally. That was much more the area, the, the way that things should go in our view. The, yeah. my, my understanding of reading the bill is you have to prove dishonesty. Uh, that's my understanding of reading it. But I presume it's whoever reads the bill, the way it's projected from, from there. Uh, certainly, that's my understanding of it anyway. Mark Griffin, do you want to come back in again? No, I would just reflect on the evidence that we've received. OK, thank you. Any other panel want to... Committee members want to come in? Yeah, Ruth McGuire. Just on the um, redetermination point, I mean, I understand the, the pain that folk are going through with, with the current system, but would it not usually be the case that the agency would be able to set something right quicker than if the person has to go to tribunal. And I guess even if it goes um, directly to tribunal, even for simple cases, is it not just going to slow things right down? I guess what I care about is, is my constituents getting the money they're entitled to. And, and the quickest way to do that feels like the agency should have an opportunity to put something right if they, if they haven't got it right the first time. Nicola. Just to be clear, I'm, I'm not advocating that the agency don't get the opportunity to do an internal review. Mm -hmm. What I'm advocating is that if they do that internal review and they do not change the decision to the customer's benefit, that, that the case then proceeds through to the tribunal. Um, that, that's the system that, that, that we've had for a number of years mm -hmm. going back beyond the Welfare Reform Act that, as, as we have at, at the moment. So I think, just to be clear, absolutely local government subscribes to the notion that decisions that are incorrect or decisions that, that perhaps need revisited are done at the lowest possible level. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that's what we're signed up to do as, a, a, as the public sector. So we're not advocating the fact that the agency don't get the opportunity to an internal review. What we're suggesting is some of the barriers that people find with the mandatory reconsideration process around about feeling disempowered, having to put in a second request to go to actual tribunal, um, customers feeling that they have to provide additional information, those types of barriers, perceived or otherwise, will be the ones that will still be retained within the system. I, I guess the, f the f obvious follow-up to that would be then, can we remove some of those barriers rather than say that, that redetermination is not, not the right way to go? Yeah. If I can maybe just uh, invoke a wee bit of how things used to be done, I'm sure colleagues around the table with their constituency work will remember Form GL24, which was the 
uh, form that claimants would have filled in whenever they were appealing any decision. And that form ultimately winds up with the tribunal, but before that, it would have been gone through the internal review process. Now, when the process was changed, the purpose of changing the process was to remove benefit pending appeal. So once you had the decision that you were being disallowed benefit, benefit stopped. Then you had to put in your request for mandatory reconsideration. Then you had to wait for that to come back to you. Then once that came back to you, you could put in your request for the appeal and benefit payment would resume. The whole purpose of MR was to remove benefit entitlement. Now, mandatory determination does not restore, does not allow for the continuation of benefit entitlement, and that's the problem. What it allows for is for the short-term um, assistance to be applied. It doesn't say in the bill how much that's going to be. It doesn't say if that's at the same rate as benefit entitlement. So the, the problem that we have here is exactly the, 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 I suppose the worry that you raise is supporting your constituents who are going through this process. What we would like to see is that there be a full uh, payment pending appeal uh, allowance, that is the, the existing benefit entitlement rate paid all the way through any kind of uh, redetermination or relook at the case, all the way through to the tribunal itself. That has to be key. What you call or what you do in between times will matter less to the claimant if they're not struggling for how to pay for what to eat. Um, what I would say in terms of terminology, however, is that having the MR term, there'll be a lot of claimants who will be coming through from reserve benefits who will be familiar with that, it, it, they will be hostile to that. I think that it's absolutely right that we should relook at everything when it comes back to us by way of going towards an appeal. And I think that's the most helpful thing for the claimants. But I think that in terms of terminology, we should definitely look at changing that as well as making sure benefit entitlement is not challenged by the redetermination process. Thank you. Paul Smith, do you want to come back? At yeah, I, I would ju just add to, to what David said. When, when mandatory reconsideration was brought in um, through the Welfare Reform Act 2012, all it really did was put another barrier in front of people before they got to a tribunal. Um, the system that, that was in place beforehand was that um, a claimant had an immediate right of appeal, but the agency undertook a, a review, and if they changed the decision in the person's favour, the appeal was cancelled. Um, so, so MR was almost a an acknowledgement by the Department of Work and Pensions that, oh, we, we might get our decision wrong, so we reserve the right to have another bite of the cherry. And by the way, until we do have that other bite, um, you, you don't have access to a tribunal. The other problem was that there was no time limit for mandatory reconsideration to, to be carried out. Benefits stopped and, and people were left in in perilous situations. Mm. Thank, thank you very much. I was going to say, I suppose, just to be clear, there is going to be a, a time limit on the, on the redetermination yeah. process, and there is um, short-term assistance um, proposed, and I, I hear what you're saying about um, benefits pending appeal. I suppose the, the challenge that springs to mind is what do we do with overpayments if the if the appeal is not successful? But. Uh, David Semple. If an appeal wasn't successful, the date of disallowance would be the date of the appeal under the old system, so there would have been no overpayment, okay. and that's what we'd want to see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm just being reminded that the government has published a, a paper on redetermination. I just wonder, I presume the panel has, has seen it? Yeah. Okay, I, I won't ask you for your comments on it. I'll just check and see if you can see it or not. Adam Tomkins, you wanted to come in on a supplementary on, the, on that? A, a different issue. I mean, okay. While we've got Cosler in front of us, um, convener, I just thought it would be um, important to get on the record um, uh, Cosler's uh, views about discretionary housing payments because there are some quite powerful remarks in the written evidence uh, that Cosler have given us. And if I can quote from it, it's uh, paragraph 11.4 of the written evidence. Um, uh, it is imperative that there is clarity over the future of DHB's discretionary housing payments as early as possible. Uh, and Cosler say that their reading of the bill suggests that there is no duty on Scottish ministers to provide funding more widely for DHBs going forward. And without that clarity, there's a risk that councils continuing to provide DHBs will find that the funding is not available in the future for this. I just wondered if I could invite Nicola Dickey while she's in front of us to expand on that, because it seems to be a very important point. Nicola. So, so I think 
from our members' point of view, we've long been calling for a kind of whole system review of discretionary housing payments. So we welcome the fact that bedroom tax will be taken will be taken care of at source. Um, that said, that doesn't get us away from the traditional discretionary housing payment. Um, so going back to the way discretionary housing payments were before bedroom tax became the kind of mainstay of what, of what was going on there. So I think from our perspective, the, the bill points to local authorities not having to have discretionary housing payments. I'm not aware of any local authority planning that, to be honest. Um, our membership came back and said, but the other thing it doesn't do is require Scottish ministers to provide funding for discretionary housing payments. So if you look at the Scottish Welfare Fund, which is a similar fund doing something slightly different, there is a, there is a statutory requirement on local authorities to provide welfare fund as long as there are monies paid in by Scottish ministers. So I think that that's the point that our members are pointing to. It's imperative that we get clarity. Um, if, if Scottish ministers are, are taking care of their commitment around about bedroom tax at source, where does that leave us with the kind of traditional side of discretionary housing payments and also um, increasingly um, cases that are being used through discretionary housing payments around about benefits cap? So mm -hmm. not, those things will not be sorted at source and there will still be a requirement for those to be dealt with in the local authorities. So I think that's where our members are coming from on, on, on that mm -hmm. perspective. Thank you. Did Thank anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else want to come in on that particular one? Okay. Oh, ben McPherson. Thank you, Convener. Again, a question uh, for, for Nicola Dickey, if you don't mind. I noticed in your evidence at 12.2 you touch on the matter of no recourse to public funds, which is something I've been doing some work on with Shakti Women's Aid in, in my constituency. I just wondered if you could just clearly articulate what, why you think it's important to be considered within the, the framework of this of this new system, given that principally it's a immigration issue, a reserved issue, but obviously it, it, it's a very complex area to, to navigate as things stand. And, and, and I think it's right that you've, you've raised it as an issue. Our, what we're looking for there is consistency. And the way the regulations are going to be developed across the various um, benefit streams, you may well come up with some quite odd um, connotations, if you like, moving forward. So what we expected to see on the face of the bill was something around about whether access to devolved social security would or would not be on the prescribed list of things that people with no recourse to um, public funds can access. So I suppose for us, we're not looking for all of the answers to be put onto the face of the bill. Mm -hmm. What we'd be looking for there is the principle. So from Scottish Minister's principle perspective, should those with no recourse to public funds be accessing de devolved social security? So that's the clarity that we're looking for. And if that has to be distilled between ongoing benefits and access to one-off payments, then that's something that we should have a conversation <coughs> about. But I suppose we were pointing to the fact that there has been no conversation, as far as we're aware, around about that type of thing. And it's not contained within the individual schedules for the, for the secondary legislation. So I don't think we have the answers. What we're saying is we need to have the conversation, given the number of um, people that we have in that situation in Scotland already. And local government very often finds themselves picking up those people if they become destitute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone you. else want to come back on that particular one? Ben McPherson. That's point that mm -hmm. not been emphasised uh, thus far, so thank you for, for bringing it forward. Can I thank the witnesses very much? Uh, very interesting. And certainly the committee will look at you know, the evidence that you have given. I can suspend uh, the meeting for about a minute to change over witnesses, and thank you very much for that. Thank you.
couple of seconds to get your paper. We'll just re resume the, the meeting. And can I welcome the second uh, panel of witnesses? Um, si Simon Hodge, Solicitor Scottish Association of Law Centres, Rob Gowans, Policy Officer, Citizens Advice Scotland, and Richard Gass, Chair of Rights Advice Scotland as well. Thank you for coming along and, and welcome to, to the meeting. Uh, I'll start with a similar question that I asked the previous witnesses. I know that you've been here, so you've probably heard their answers in regards to previous sessions that uh, we've asked the witnesses for their views on the principles and the proposed charter. Uh, can you tell us your views and in what way, if any, you know, the principles of the proposed charter uh, would have an influence on the workings of the new benefits agency? Rob Gowans, I'll start with you. Um, we, um, we welcome the um, work on the principles generally, um, particularly things around um, even the, um, the, gov the government has a role in ensuring that people um, receive all the income they're entitled to. That's very important. Um, around um, and the principle that um, that social security is a is a human right. Um, we have in, um, suggested a couple of a couple of other principles that that might be included that the system should be accessible and fair, and that procedures decision making and review should be handled quickly and effectively. Um, in terms of some of the the other things that have been that have been suggested or that could be included as as principles, um, in particular the the right to independent advice, um, we'd agree that 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 should be. Um, should be in the face of the bill, whether that's necessarily as a as a principle, um, um, wouldn't wouldn't be sure. It might it might be that um, that that would that would sit better in another part of part of the bill. Um, in terms of the charter, again, it's something that um, that we've welcomed. That's something that has the potential um, to um, um, allow individuals to secure their rights. Um, where we're not um, especially clear is is quite um, is quite what status the the charter would have in terms of conveying individual rights. Um, our understanding from uh, the, the government's consultation last year was was that it was almost going to be a, a bill of rights, if you were um, set out people's rights and responsibilities, which would allow them to um, um, those to be those to be achieved and them to seek seek redress. Um, from the bill, it's not it's not clear that that's that's the purpose of of the charter. Um, so um, you think that there there should potentially be some some clarity around that, as well as uh, um, uh, the the right to um, raise feedback and um, and, com and complaints and um, uh, to achieve uh, um, redress if if um, it falls short of the um, the principles and people's rights um, under the system. Thank you. Uh, Richard Gatchman, just come in. Well, we're pleased to see the, the principles laid out at the very start of the bill, making it clear up front that the social security system in Scotland is going to be that bit different to the, the rest of the UK. Uh, the, the list of principles could perhaps go slightly further to include uh, what to do if you're dissatisfied with the, the treatment you get from the social security system and also are a commitment that the, the level of benefits paid within Scottish Social Security will be, that the value of them will be protected in, in real terms uh, with regard to inflation. Uh, the fact that there's going to also be a charter is welcome. It's not one or other, it's both. I think the charter is very valuable. It will be a more uh, readily accessible document. Uh, a paragraph of a, a, an Act of Parliament will be somewhat distant, but a charter could be as long as it's not too long. It could be up on the walls in social security offices, so for folk waiting to be seen, they can see the charter. It might be the first time they've read it, they'll get an understanding that this is a bit different. Furthermore, the charter could be something that is incorporated into the, the personal development plans for the members of staff working within the agency. Thank you very much. That, that was one of the follow-up questions I was going to ask about what you thought of it, and I'll maybe come back on that. It's Simon Hodge. Um, again, we're in a very similar place. We're very pleased to see that the principles are being provided and that there's a, a starting point to make a real effort to make this a very different system than, than, exists, uh, than has, has existed before. 
I would also reiterate I think it is important to have a right for independent advice in terms of a uh, one of, I'd, I'd just put it in terms of one of the principles and uh, I think in terms of the independent advice there are, there are a whole variety of reasons which I can come on to if you wish me to elaborate on that as to why I think that's very important to have advice which is independent provided for people uh, the I'd, on a, how, how this is exactly provided, I would also reiterate to some degree our, uh, what was what was said at an earlier session in terms of private providers. Our experience, is certainly in, in uh, working in this field for many years, has not been a happy one when it's been the private providers for the, uh, particularly in terms of the medical assessors mm -hmm. and the system that's been uh, put forward there, and something in there to to protect against that that, that type of a uh, system coming back into into place and, pro and probably in terms of not having pri private providers would be would be helpful in terms of the charter again i agree with richard it, but it has to be clear language that's the one thing i would say if this is something that's intended to be there and as a guide for people coming into social security benefit offices it really does have to be in clear language and very straightforward uh, and i would also I agree that some form of complaints procedure would also be necessary in there. I think that would be very helpful. And I think that also has to go right across the board and uh, not just for the, the members of staff that the, in terms of the, 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 the general members of staff, but also going back to the medical assessors as well. I think there has to be some complaints procedure put into the charter in terms of the treatment that's been provided but and that, by claimants, uh, or at least how they perceived, perceived to be treated by, by the medical assessors. Thank you. It won't be a question, but just a comment on, on what Richard Gass has said. That many folk have said the charter should be there visible, that people know what their rights are. So obviously it's important we get this charter correct uh, for the benefit of the people that's uh, accessing uh, social security. So I just wanted to make that comment. It'd be good if it was up in every office and people had access to it as well. Um, Adam Tompkins, you wanted to come in, and then Jeremy. Uh, thank you, convener, um, and good morning. I, I wanted to um, pick up the point that made very strongly in Cass's written evidence, for which many thanks indeed, um, uh, that it's Cass's view, quite strong view, um, that the balance between um, primary and secondary legislation in this bill is not quite right, and that there are a number of issues um, that are um, not in the bill, which in Cass's view should be uh, in the bill. And I wonder, just for the record, Mr. Gowans, if you'd like to you know, specify that and expand on that, and then I'd like to invite the other members of the panel to um, reflect on the extent to which they agree, if I may. Yeah, um, I think it's, we, kind of our view is particularly if there are things which would be, would be common um, across the, the social security um, benefits that they would, be, they would be on the face of the bill and things that would be essential to the system. Already mentioned um, um, provision for um, for complaints and, and redress and people to give feedback. We think that could work in a similar way to um, section 14 and 15 of the Patients' Rights Act, um, for instance, would um, would provide a good model for that. Um, I think to make provision for an in independent scrutiny or independent scrutiny bodies, um, such as um, playing a similar role to the um, the current Social Security. Um, advisory committee um, does at uh, UK level, although there are perhaps some slight slight differences um, mm -hmm. in in how that that could be designed. For instance, it um, um, part of it could um, potentially report to to the Scottish Parliament and to committees to aid their scrutiny as well as um, to help the um, the Scottish government design um, the regulations. Um, I think there should be provision for um, uprating on the face of the bill um, that um, benefits should be should be uprated on an annual basis in line with RPI and there's some, um, um, some additional things that we think might, um, might be taken into account such as, um, such as energy costs, transport costs, um, basically the, to make sure that the benefits have, have the same value um, each year and if, if there's things that, um, that they're intended to pay for, funeral costs being a, um, being a, a great example um, in that um, we we see um, sort of rising issues of, of funeral poverty um, and that if funeral payments, for instance, were kept in line with, with average funeral costs. Can I, can I costs, just come in and slightly just 
previously when you were talking yeah. about funeral costs, you said obviously, uh, you know, benefits should be, should be on the face of the bill, it should be upgraded mm -hmm. uh, if certain things happen, such as energy costs, yep. which is obviously reserved to Westminster. Yep. The Scottish Parliament doesn't have control over that. So are you saying that if the energy companies, as unfortunately has happened just now, put the, the cost of electricity and gas up by a great deal of percentage, that, on the, that should be on the face of the bill, that if that happens... The benefits that are devolved to the Scottish Parliament should be you know, raised. What happens to the benefits from the Westminster Parliament? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, in terms of what we what we suggest is that um, is that on an annual basis that um, that the devolved benefits are uprated by by RPI. Um, what I think would be would be helpful is to um, um, ministers the the power or the responsibility to consider things like like energy costs um, to make sure that they are it's not necessarily a, um, a kind of a formal lock into the process if you will um, but that um, to make sure that benefits help, or would always have the um, they wouldn't lose value over over the years that they would they would sort of pay for the same the same things that they um, that they would um, in the previous year um, in terms of how that would operate with um, with reserve benefits, it might well be the case that um, that the value of um, benefits in Scotland is is higher than than that in in the the equivalent UK benefits. But I think that's that's potentially a, a feature of of devolution and um, and something that um, that certainly in the in the Scottish context we'd welcome sort of benefits being um, being adequate and. Um, and keeping their keeping their value as the years go on. Would you say, sorry for interrupting again, would you say then that if it's in regards to energy costs that go up, then perhaps Westminster should give more money to the Scottish Government then? If they're going to <coughs> the benefits to that extent? I mean I think we'd always be keen that that sort of um, that sort of actions taken to make sure that energy costs are are low. Um, are low anyway. I, th I think probably the um, whilst it's sort of social security has a, a sort of vital role in in tackling poverty and is, is one of the best ways of doing that, um, it doesn't mean that there's not other action that that can and should be taken and, and sort of energy costs is a, is a good example of that. So, sorry. I no, no, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, I, I, I can just get back to the, the bill and the structure of the bill and this, yes. this, you know, this relationship between um, uh, primary and, and, mm -hmm. and, and secondary legislation because, I mean, in your written evidence, Mr. Gowan, you go even further than mm -hmm. you've just um, uh, shared with the committee and you say that details of eligibility and operation of many of the reserve benefits are in mm -hmm. primary legislation. That doesn't appear to be the case in, in, in this bill. Mm -hmm. uh, would you be looking for amendments at stage two? I know we're still on stage one, but would you be looking for amendments at stage two to put some of those details on the face of the bill? Possibly, although um, my understanding is that um, is the, last, the eligibility criteria is still to be developed for for the benefits. Um, if there's um, information that's that's available, at least at least the basics, then um, I think. Um, it, from watching the previous evidence session that um, the Child Poverty Action Group suggested the best start grant, for instance, where that's a bit more, um, the rules for that are a bit more developed, mm. then that might be something that could be brought in, or potentially at a, at a later date when um, if it's are up and running, that they could be, they could be brought into the, the act at a future, at a future point, to, um, I think, to, to set out the, um, I suppose to set out the, the eligibility and the process um, up front on, in, the, in the face of primary legislation. I think it probably can, can operate um, without that, that being there at, at this point, but I think in, in terms of um, the, I think it would potentially come back to the, the, the sort of point I made earlier around um, the independent scrutiny of of regulations, it's, it's a, a sort of massively important. Of if if a lot of the the system is to be developed through um, through regulations, which which there are a sort of um, sort of good arguments for um, for in that some of yeah. some of it is is quite is quite detailed and possibly wouldn't be appropriate for primary legislation. That that's that's effectively effectively scrutinised and has sort of independent expert 
input. So you'd rather have that level of detail scrutinised by independent experts than by Parliament? You think independent scrutiny is more important than parliamentary scrutiny? Um, I think I, I either could could work with the uh, with the bill. I think that the, the would the, the, sort of the level of scrutiny of whoever would scrutinise it is is very important. Okay, Mr. Gas, did you want to come into that particular part? Or? Yes, sir. The Act lays out very broadly what the social security system is going to look like and leaves a lot of the detail to the regulations which we've yet to see. And I think it's correct that regulations are the place where the detail will be expanded upon. However, uh, what we're creating here is a new, a new system and we're only going to have one chance at creating it for the first time, which I think is something we've heard coming to ourselves from, from uh, Scottish Government Ministers. So in order to have it correct for the first time, we maybe need to ensure that there's maybe some extra scrutiny available for the first iteration of the regulations. Uh, the, the way that the, the processes are for uh, the negative or affirmative procedures would be insufficient because it's all or nothing. However, the, 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 the Parliament are not constrained to have something as, as crude as the, the negative or positive. Mm -hmm. They could introduce into this bill uh, uh, a requirement that the, the first uh, iteration of the regulations are given to external organisations <coughs> for, for scrutiny, but also that draft regulations could then come back to the to elected members to consider uh, if there are further amendments. So I, just would, I, would, I would recommend that some super affirmative or greater process mm. is introduced for the, the first draft of these, these regulations. Mm. And, sorry, interesting point. Uh, Mr Hoyes, did you want to come in on that? Uh, certainly, I'd, I'd reiterate that certainly in terms of the existing systems as they are, what they usually do, the DLA system did and the PIP system did in terms of the Administration Act and the Welfare Reform Act, is they set down the basic framework of the, the, the basic, the primary conditions on which the, the system was going to be operated on and then obviously the regulations then dealt with some of the details. There's, there's actually some good arguments to say that that should be put forward to Parliament so that we've got a good idea and it's been properly scrutinised what the basic, the, if you like, the pillars of this system are. There's also arguments, obviously, that it has to be dealt with under the regulations. So I, I can see good argument for, along the similar lines as the existing system is already in play, the pillars are, a, are, are put into the, a, into the bill itself. There is, there is a caveat here, which is that um, working within this system, the, the detail is where the devil uh, resides, mm -hmm. and the real problems in terms of how these benefits, which can be designed in a particular method, and are then subverted, is done by quite often done by regulation. So, unfortunately, even putting the primary conditions in the mm -hmm. bill is not necessarily going to safeguard that this bill that these that they will operate along the lines that you've that they were first intended as. Uh, other than that, they, I would also reiterate what, what I'd heard earlier in terms of there are areas that would be useful to be in the bill and uh, uprating, backdating and residency as well. I think residency is an important one in this particular climate mm. to be in the bill too. Thank, thank you very much. Did you want to come in again, Mr Duncan? I can come in later. Come in okay. later. Jeremy Balfour, do you want <coughs> to come in? Uh, thank you, Gavina, and good uh, morning. I wonder, two questions. Uh, it's interesting just picking up this one on residency. Um, and we had quite a long discussion last week, or the week before perhaps, in regard to cross-border residency, if people move around, um, if they're on benefit, and then we move to England or Wales, what happens to that benefit? I wonder if you've got any views around that area, and, and how do we define that in, in the bill? I'm, I'm second issue just to follow up on is, obviously all three of your organisations do a lot of representation. Um, I, how do you see the difference between advice and representation? And do you see that as two different things? And should they be defined differently or can we be defined collectively? And if so, the same question I asked to the previous panel in regard to should there be a statutory funding for that? And how do you access that? Because obviously, to some degree, you wouldn't want to probably say this, but you're in slight competition with each other as to who you're representing. And how do we then divide the, the money up to make sure that the right people are representing the right individuals? So lots there, sorry for the long question. Mr Gass, did you want to get that one? 
Well, well, clearly, the, in terms of residence, this is the Scottish social security system, so it's for folk who are resident in Scotland. If someone were to then relocate to south of the border, then the entitlement would no longer be to the Scottish benefits. However, there might be some, some period whereby, uh, yeah, I don't know, three months or whatever, that could, a, a figure could be arrived at that you could continue your entitlement while establishing your, your entitlement to the, the, the UK benefits. Uh, something maybe similar for folk coming to, in, in, into Scotland. We do have uh, habitual residence rules within the DWP regulations. Uh, they are quite cumbersome, but within them there will be some, some examples of when it would be appropriate to commence a benefit for someone. Effectively, when someone has shown beyond doubt that this is the place of their new, of their new address. Uh, in relation to advice versus representation, I think the agency itself can provide advice on, on the benefits, but they can't advocate for someone. They can only give advice within the constraints of how their organisation perceives entitlement. Representation can push the boundaries of entitlement by uh, taking matters to the tribunals, to courts, establishing case law. So I think advice and representation are, are very different. There's actually a third category, and that's advocacy. Uh, and advocacy would be ensuring that a person's voice was heard and it would stand aside from uh, the advice and the, the representation. Finally, should there be a pot of money that we all bid for? Then that's a, a kind of loaded question. There should be adequate, there should be adequate funding for, for advice services, but it's, a, it's not simply a Scottish Government duty to fund advice. Local authorities themselves have a vested interest in the, the population within their area receiving advice. And depending on the different areas of Scotland, it may be that a local authority chooses to, to invest in a, a, a greater manner. There should be certainly no hindrance to that. It would be nice if there was a, a, a a guaranteed sum of money for the future, but the danger with that could be that uh, other funding providers step back saying, well, the money is now allocated by Scottish Government, therefore they may not need to, to come forward. Mm -hmm. good, very, very good point. Uh, Rob Gowans, did you want to come in on that yeah. one? Yeah, um, it was on the, on the kind of cross-border um, issue firstly. Um, yes, it is, is slightly complicated. Um, we would we would also like to see to, um, residency on the on the face of the bill. In terms of the situation you're describing, we had a bit of a around um, around sort of how some of the cross border issues might work, and um, there could be sort of criteria set. For instance, if someone if someone um, sort of worked worked in England but lived in Scotland, um, it would be things around where they spend most of their time. In terms of somebody moved moved to England, I think it would um, right, that they would they would then fall under the remit of the of the UK system. But I think that's that's probably something that um, um, or it's the sort of the Scottish governments and, and sort of UK government to um, to work together on seeing to find a re reciprocal arrangement um, system. In terms of the the kind of the role of, of independent advice, we'd we'd consider it a, a sort of an essential part of a, a well functioning social security system, regardless of, of how good the um, the agency was and um, and what um, what services we're providing. We we particularly welcome the the sort of the the commitment to have a, a sort of face to face element um, and the the agency staff and think that's that's important. But in any event, the um, independent advice would always be needed. Um, last year, for instance, we um, provided advice on over 94,000 issues related to the benefits that are due to be devolved. Um, whilst it, it might be the case that, um, that 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 may reduce over time if if um, if the system's well well designed, but there would always be a need for that. And certainly, as the um, from our experience, when when changes are made, there is always a bit of a an increase in, in demand, particularly of people um, coming in for information about what, how changes might, uh, might affect, affect them. Um, in terms of what um, would be reflected in the bill, we would, we would support uh, um, um, a, a duty on the, the Scottish ministers to make, make provision for access to, um, to independent advice um, um, and, that, um, and that they should be required to make sure that it's that that would be that would be adequately resourced. Um, 
currently it's um, um, Vice Woods would largely be funded through um, from sort of local authorities. Um, be the, the risk that I think the, um, that there would be an assumption made that um, the advice would always would always be there that um, there'd always be a, a CAB, um, but I think there's that does require that does require funding, and um, I think that that would be that would be helpful to guarantee that that within the bill. Um, also, separately, um, independent independent advocacy, um, which we would we would also support. Um, Right to that in the in the bill, which is which is something that's quite quite different from independent advice. Mm -hmm. Ben McPherson, did you want to come in a supplementary there before I bring in Mr. Hodge? Uh, yeah, just very briefly, yes. um, just for clarity, uh, Mr. Goins, the, any right to independent advice or advocacy, you would only be uh, putting that forward strictly with relation to devolved benefits. If you were going to contain such a principle or, or uh, clause otherwise within this piece of legislation? I think one of the, one of the things that I think um, is particularly helpful about independent advice is that, um, certainly to speak in terms of the, the citizens' advice services, that ours is, ours is holistic. Um, for instance, um, if... Um, yes. um, Sorry to interrupt you, yeah. but it, it, I guess to, 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 to reword my question, this is a, a social security bill about the devolved yeah. social security benefits to this parliament, mm -hmm. to this country. Surely it would only be appropriate for any advice that was attached to this bill to only be applicable to those powers that are applicable to this parliament. I think what you would find is that... Um, is that if, if sort of funding funding was provided or advice was was provided that it would it would sit within our the sort of the wider nice landscape. So for instance, if um, somebody was to come in for advice about about devolved benefits, that that would that would be in addition to the the service that would, that would be provided. So they'd be able to to get advice about about reserve benefits, for instance, sort of um, employment support allowance mm -hmm. if they had housing or. Uh, or problems at work, then they could they could get advice about that as well. I mean, I appreciate that yeah. uh, Citizens Advice Scotland and the, the bureaus in my constituency do remarkable yeah. work in terms of advice across the, the, the whole spectrum of mm. social security. But if, if such a, a duty was going to be placed within this bill, a duty placed on Scottish ministers, mm. on the Scottish government, on the on the budgets of of this. Uh, mm of the government of this country, it would be unfair and unreasonable for such resources to be, I, I'm asking this as a question, not as a, as a, a proposition, mm -hmm. but would it be unreasonable for those resources to be utilised to advise on complications with the reserved system? Uh, I think that there's a yeah. nuance there and there's an important distinction yeah. about what advice is provided and maybe yeah. actually provision of specialised advice and particular advice mm. to do with the devolved benefits would be a, a more meaningful uh, yeah. way to move forward and if, yeah. a, if an advice provision was mm. going to be included. Yeah, I take your point and I think it would depend on how, how such a provision would be drafted. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you. Mr Hodge, did you want to come in that way? Just, just to pick up on that point, there is a, there's, a, there's a problem of practicality here because you get one person coming in and they have a raft of problems that they have to be dealt with. If you are funded simply to give advice on the devolved benefits, it, it really would create a very odd position where you can give advice on a particular area and not then expand it to go into the, into the, uh, the reserved matters as well. So the, I, I can see from the perspective of that this is, this is looking at a social security bill and looking at the, uh, the areas that, that, that are contained within the bill and therefore the funding should only really be given. There is, there is an alternative uh, approach to which is they are actually Scottish subjects and uh, as, a, as a Scottish government to look at, at actually uh, making sure that the Scottish subjects have the best possible independent advice that they can have and if that's across the board as it quite often necessarily has to be then that's a, that's a matter of practicality really. Yes. I, I absolutely appreciate that, that mm. practicality on, on, on the ground and uh, I guess the, the, the intention that uh, I'm getting from 
ministers and from the, the content of the bill so, uh, so far, and actually was touched upon in the evidence this morning, it, is that there's an ambition within this piece of legislation and within the creation of the new agency and within the creation of a new culture to reduce the demand on advice services. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it's, it's just a, a, a practical, and again, a practical issue on, on the other side of the argument about if, if a right to advocacy or advice um, representation isn't going to be included in this bill, I think we need to be quite careful and specific about it because, as uh, Mr. Balfour raised, there's an issue of resource oh, yeah, and funding yeah, within yeah. all of this mm -hmm. about you know, making sure that such a, a principle or, a, or other requirement within the, the drafting of the bill was deliverable in, in, uh, with reference to the fact that it, it is a bill about the, the, dev the devolved yeah. benefits only. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I, it's a complication that's born out of the fact that this isn't a social security bill for the whole social security system. And I think it's, it's quite demonstrative of the complexities because of that point. Um, I, 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 there's not necessarily a clear question there, but I think it's more of a, a, a discussion. <laughs> that's an identification of the, the stress lines, yeah. <laughs> Did you want to come back on that particular one, Mr. Hodge? Uh, no, I mean, I've, I've made my position. I mean, I think mm -hmm. what we're getting is, is a, a, an indication of Mr. McPherson's worries and concerns. And I do. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a finite pot of money, and that is where the, where the kind of stress lines actually mm -hmm. cross over. And I was simply ma making the point as a practical matter that the, it, it can be difficult to put what might be a, a very good policy in terms of the Social Security Bill, in practical terms it might be quite difficult to actually mm. achieve that. The, there's, there's one point I wanted to make about the residents and one mm. thing that you might want to consider is I agree with them that when, when somebody moves from Scotland and is, is habitually resident down south, uh, there will be a period they, they will not be they shouldn't have access to this, the, the benefits that are contained within the bill. You may want to consider a temporary period of overlap. We've got this already with the carers' allowance when a person dies and the carers' allowance goes on for a period of mm. time thereafter. There will be a there'll, people by necessity may have to move for any number of reasons, and there may be a period where their, their benefits simply their, their benefits contained within this bill simply stop and a period of time where they actually take to actually catch up. That could mean a period of time without funds that they could well do with. And to maybe have a look at having some sort of ongoing entitlement to to allow them to a uh, to, to get up to scratch, to get up to speed with what they need to apply for down south may be something to mm -hmm. worth considering. Yeah, very interesting. I, I just wanted to pick up the point before I bring Ruth Maguire in about the practicalities uh, of the, the previous discussion. Mm. Uh, at the moment in time, we as MSPs can't do work about Social Security mm. that's reserved mm -hmm. because we don't, it's, it hasn't devolved. So that's, that's a problem in itself. Mm -hmm. And the other problem in itself also is when people come for advice and we have the charter, depending if it's on the face of the bill or whatever legislation, uh, affirmative or, or negative that's there, if you had the recourse to go to court, there's a bit of a problem there if they, if they go for advice and, and, and they don't get uh, the, the Social Security monies, they could perhaps think that they can take this to court, as has been suggested by, by some, but it may be on the reserve side. So I think it's something we really perhaps will maybe talk to uh, our counterparts in Westminster. I think it's something yeah, that really yeah, needs... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ben first wants to come in on that. We want to end Ruth McGuire. <laughs> Clearly, to try and bring things together, I'm really supportive of the advice sector and I'm just looking for a way that we can if there is room in this bill in a realistic way to bring in support for the advice sector I'd be really interested in any clear propositions on how we do that given the complexity of, of what we're handling okay. yes Mr. Come in with what thoughts are going through <laughs> my head clearly yes the, the, the devolved matters the agency itself can only really give advice or information on the devolved matters. However, I think staff should be trained to be aware that there are the UK benefits and be aware that there are interactions and the role for the agency would then be to signpost and they would signpost to what we maybe refer to as the advice sector. Mm -hmm. If there were funds available for the advice sector to expand the advice, then they could bid for that funding, but 
they would provide that advice alongside the other advice they provide. So someone <coughs> signposted by the agency to local authority or to, to CAB could then get advice on how do the Scottish benefits now interact with the, with the, with the UK benefits. I think something needs to be looked at in that particular one. Thank you. Ruth Maguire. Thanks. At last. I think, uh, colleague, Ben made some interesting points. and I, I don't think any of us would deny the, the complexity of people's lives and, and the assistance that we have to give them. I guess I suppose it's just that thing about how do we put that bit about advice on the bill. But anyway, that was not a question. My questions... <laughs> <laughs> small reflection. Uh, my questions are actually about overpayments. Um, and the Scottish Government suggested there should be a minimum income floor um, to try and protect um, people from being driven into poverty. Do you think this will help? And how would you see it working? Mr Gass. I'll just speak well before the, <laughs> while the audience arrive for the important question. Uh, on, on overpayments, taking into consideration someone's financial circumstances before seeking recovery is a very welcome proposal. Uh, exactly how you set that level is maybe a more, a, more, a more challenging task. But there are other aspects of overpayments which, although the, the policy memorandum makes reference to the bill does not, the, the bill as it stands suggests that official error overpayments could be within the scope of recovery. The policy memorandum suggests that they would be out of scope mm -hmm. and I think that the bill therefore needs to be amended to make that, that crystal clear that agency errors will not be uh, recovered unless there are exceptional circumstances and perhaps spell out what those exceptional circumstances may be. Sure. Do anyone else want to come back on that? Rob yeah, Gowns. I think that um, we would um, we'd welcome the, the commitment to the, the minimum income floor. I think there's um, things that, that can be done, such as the use of um, the common financial statement, um, sort of limiting the um, the amount of direct deductions that can be that can be removed from from someone's benefit to to repay an overpayment um, to make sure that people aren't aren't experiencing hardship. Um, it's, uh, um, I'd also um, sort of share um, share Richard's concerns about um, about the the drafting of of the the bills that stands in relation to overpayments because of of agency error. Um, as then from the the policy memorandum is that the Scottish government don't intend to pursue it unless in cases where there's been a, a large overpayment made. Um, we would prefer that um, that the the bill. Would um, would set out that the overpayments um, that are made because of an agency error are um, aren't recoverable at all, even if they are they are large. Um, I think that that basically would reflect um, reflect the situation in, in most um, most UK benefits at the at the moment, and also doesn't mean that that someone who um, has received an overpayment through no fault of their own um, would be would be required <coughs> to, to pay it back, and that um, that that it would also sort of create a, a sort of incentive for, I suppose, the the agency to perform well in, in making accurate payments. Mm -hmm. Mr. Um, Hodge, I, I would agree. That's one, it's certainly one of our concerns in terms of the overpayments, because primarily the, one of the one of the biggest areas that the bill is going to deal with is disability but disability benefits. That would create a very different provision in terms of overpayments uh, in, down south compared to up here. It would be far more uh, it would be far more stringent up here, because cu uh, currently you have to show a uh, misrepresentation or failure to disclose in order to get an overpayment down south. This isn't the case here. Uh, the the other the other thing too is it does seem to fly slightly in the face of the, some of the principles that are set out at the beginning of the bill in terms of dignity and human rights etc. There there also is a there, there's a again if we're looking at having to get a good relationship between the department and the claimants, one of the things I certainly know from my own experience in representing clients is that if they feel they've not actually contributed to something and it's not been their fault and they're nevertheless having to pay it back. That is a problem, and that, that any any good work that's then done between trying to create a new system, that is one of the things that would undermine it. 
Another one, and this is a, a kind of curious one, is that it will come out to them that if you happen to be living in England, you wouldn't begin to have to repay this, whereas if you're living here in Scotland, you're having to repay, and that would further undermine, I think, any good work that might be done in terms of the relationship between the clients and uh, the claimants, rather, and uh, uh, the, uh, the agency. In terms of the financial flow, I would just reiterate what my colleagues have said here, but I would add something else. I think it's also important to bring in somebody's own personal circumstances into account there, and that's missing from the bill just now. There can be many reasons other for there can be many reasons as to why somebody does what they do. It doesn't necessarily mean that you should try and recover the money from them. And one of the one of the primary ones is where there is domestic abuse involved. Mm -hmm. Now, that currently would be caught under the overpayment provisions. The person would then be in an, 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 an even worse position of having to repay. And then the domestic abuse could then have a, a potential of actually increasing at that point. And the, the reason for the, uh, for, for the overpayment occurring could be actually as a result of the domestic abuse. So I think, and also mental health is another one in terms of in terms of person's mental health and whether uh, recovering the overpayment would actually lead to a possible deterioration of mental health. There are areas here that, in terms of the discretion that's used for not recovering the overpayments, are, that I think are welcomed in terms of finances, but I think they ought to be brought in doubt a bit to take somebody's entire uh, circumstances into account. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Uh, following on from that, do you agree there should be a definition between unintentional error and intentional fraud in the bill? And how do the DWP treat these differences at the moment? If there's been an overpayment, are we talking about? When was the hard? Sorry. No, no. Okay, Mr. Fraud yes. in the DWP regulations is, is as Mr. Hodges described, it's mm -hmm. did someone fail to disclose material fact or did they misrepresent their circumstances? So that's the intentional, the unintentional uh, error would be perhaps they didn't make, they didn't advise of a, a change in circumstances. Now, a person might not know that uh, a, a fact is a circumstance to be reported. <coughs> However, if someone uh, is, aware, is clearly aware that their, their circumstances have changed and they ought to report that, then that failure to report the change of circumstances would be an intentional mm -hmm. matter. And do you think that should be detailed on our bill? I think there should be something in the bill that makes it clear that there's a, a duty to disclose your information, but it should also be in the bill that where there is uh, an error that occurs uh, out with the, the duties on the individual, so it's an official error, mm. then the, the official error overpayments will not be recoverable. Unless, you know, you could, could concede that unless the person ought to know that they were being overpaid. So, so if someone gets a lottery win one week rather than their weekly payment, then quite clearly something's gone wrong. It might mm. be inappropriate that they would have the right therefore to, to retain that money but if someone reports a change there's no the, the benefit then is unaltered to discover five six years later that they've been overpaid and because of the quantity involved that that was now above a threshold and had to be recovered that would be somewhat unfair mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mr hodge you wanted to come back on no that no one? i was just I, I was wondering if if we were moving into if you are moving into the pen the the fraud, fraudulent penalties question or whether we're still Talking about overpayment. No, I, I'm, okay. I'm, I was just trying to clarify whether that was being questioned. Okay. Did you want to come back? No, in? I'm fine. Okay. Jeremy Balfour. <coughs> I mean, can I just go back? I mean, I think Ben McPherson's raised a very interesting issue about who funds Sorry. what. And I suppose it maybe goes back to one of the questions just to piece a bit harder. Should we separate advice and assistance and representation into three different areas? So that perhaps if someone comes in and there's general advice given that is funded maybe from this pot of money, but in regard to assistance and representation, that would only be for the devolved benefits. Would it be helpful to make a very clear distinction between the three areas of work so that there is no confusion on that? Or is that going to make it even more complicated in practice? Uh, want to come in on that, Rob Gibbons? I think there's, um, making a distinction between independent advice and independent advocacy is important. Whether we'd make the distinction between independent advice and representation, um, I think there's... I think we'd probably be, be cautious about that, um, particularly because of the nature of the, the sort of the independent service that we 
that we provide is that um, is that people into a CAB would um, be able to get advice on um, sort of all, all range of things related to the um, to a social security benefit from making an application all the way through to um, um, in representation at um, at tribunal. Um, I think in terms of the, the the funding, there's there's obviously considerations there. But I think even um, even with well function system, I think you would you would still have um, need for for advice on some of the I suppose some of the more basic elements making applications as as well as the the sort of the the representation function, which I think is is important that 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 is an independent function and, and it isn't really something that that could be provided by um, by the agency. Does anyone at the panel want to come in on, on that? I think there should be a duty on the agency to provide information on the benefits that it's delivering and a duty on the agency to signpost to the advice sector for information on, on the uh, reserve benefits. When it comes to what the advice agencies provide to the individual when they come through the door, without funding, these agencies are going to provide information on everything. That's the nature of the organisation. Mm -hmm. If there's extra funding available to... to to make it easier, then that's great. Uh, but it's going to be difficult to constrain advice agencies to saying, right, here's the piece that I'm funded for and here's the piece that I'm not funded for. Uh, I think you'd be adding complications unnecessarily there. Mm -hmm. Did you want to come in on that one, Mr Hodge? Yeah, that's similar okay. to the point you making before. Yeah. Mark Griffin, do you want to come in and then George Adams? Thanks, Kevinera. I think we were about to move on to the new offences that were created in the bill and the uh, committee's received evidence from Justice Scotland and Gender and others about a concern that the new offences are <coughs> um, overly harsh in comparison with the UK system, that there's a potential for a criminal offence um, for an honest mistake um, rather than the UK system where pros prosecution has to prove dishonesty to, to take that case to court. I wonder in what your interpretation was of, of the new offences as drafted. Mr Hodge, do you want to, because you, you wanted to comment I mean, on the, the one, one of the clauses uh, does, I think clause 39, uh, that does mean that you have to show intent. The other one doesn't, mm -hmm. and that's the one that we've got a problem with. Uh, you're correct, it is different from the UK system, and that, that again brings an argument I've said before. It can be quite unfortunate to see that a new system which is trying to uh, engender dignity and human rights, etc., is actually g giving less protection to the, to the Scottish subjects than they would have in the, in, uh, down south. Uh, I have problems even with the... Uh, the drafting of the legislation itself, which I think in particular in Clause 40, 40 is particularly weak because the, what, what it allows for is that the, the person a, ought to have known that the change might result. That's the only protection, might result. A, now, that is, that's equivalent of saying that the person suspects that something might be wrong. And that's a very low threshold to pass in order to criminalise. And we have to remember we're criminalising people. The effect of criminalising has a huge effect on people's in, in, in individuals' lives, from credit ratings, from insurance, from travel, etc. So it shouldn't be looked on lightly in terms of when, when somebody has a criminal record. And that in particular, simply to say that you, you suspect that something might be wrong, is a far too, uh, in, in our p p position anyway, is too low a threshold. And we'd also go further to say that the, uh, the, the protection, the, we've got the protection that, that, that is the most similar to this is actually in the housing benefit overpayment regulations. Now, they themselves have been described by one upper tribunal judge as draconian. Now, the problem you've got here is that the, in order to show that somebody has reason, can reasonably be expected to realise that something is wrong, it's a low threshold. I mean, we've got cases, for example, where a couple uh, correctly gave on four different occasions the correct information to local authority, but it was still held to be recoverable because the person knew or ought to have known. And the problem we've got here is that Although the person may have given the right information, the point at which that benefit then continues to be in place, the be there could be argued to be a position where the person knows that that information hasn't got to the right, right, right place, and therefore any overpayment that's done thereafter is, is recoverable. 
and uh, we've got uh, a, another case where a, a particular gentleman of, uh, had, if I remember rightly in this one, they had a, he had a very limited experience with the housing benefit system. He had a put in for housing benefit. He had given his wage slips completely correctly. His weekly wage slip was assessed by the local authority as an annual wage slip, and he was given full housing benefit. Immediately prior to that, he had actually gone in to see his housing benefit office, and the person who had incorrectly put in the information had told him he was going to get full housing benefit. It was still held that he ought to have known, because when he got the letter in, which identified where the mistake was made, he ought to have read that in full. Now, that's a letter that's about eight pages long. It's quite difficult to decipher. So the problem we've got here in terms of the... Uh, the, the, pro the problem we've got in terms of the protection is actually very low in terms of Clause 40. And I, I would say it's far too low, but our position in this one anyway is in the bottom line, if you're looking at a criminal record, there really ought to be criminal intent, and that ought to be in the bill. It's in Clause 39, it should be in Clause 40 as well. Um, Mr Gass, did you want to come in on that one? I'd agree with what, what, what's been said, that you cannot have a crime where there's not been an intention to commit the crime. That's just wrong. We would wonder, like the Scots law of common law fraud, is that not sufficient to cover offences that would arise under, under the Scottish social security system anyway? Is there a need to have so much detail? Would it not be sufficient to say that where someone has attempted to obtain benefit by fraudulent means that this will be prosecuted under the, the, the common law of fraud? Mm -hmm. Rob Gowans, did you want to come in on that one? Um, only that um, I sort of uh, um, agree with a lot of the points that, that have already been made. I mean, we'd, um, we would um, welcome drawing the, I think, the, as much of a distinction as, as possible between unintentional overpayments and deliberate fraud. Um, I think where um, somebody, if somebody was prosecuted for fraud, I think that would need to be um, really unambiguous that it was, that it was done deliberately and with intent, um, not um, that they couldn't inadvertently be, be sucked into it because of, um, because of lack of awareness of the rules or, or not declaring something that they, um, in error or because they didn't realise they had to, had to declare it. Um, and I think there's potentially some, some work that could go on um, around this, around, around some of the reasons why, why fraud happens in the, in the first place. Um, in, in terms of disability benefits, um, the, um, I think the, the rate of fraud, according to the official statistics, is 0.5%, so it's, it's a very small proportion <coughs> way um, from speaking to, to advisors. Um, they don't often encounter sort of situations where there's been fraud. Where it is, it's either um, because of people's lack of, lack of awareness of the rules or because somebody is in absolute desperate financial hardship and has made a made a desperate a desperate move. So I think there's there's some stuff that, that could be done around that as well as within the system to um, to sort of reduce reduce fraud. But we'd we'd welcome a sort of a, a, a drawing a clear distinction between between overpayments and fraud. Thank you, and Mr. Hodge. You mentioned clause what forty, didn't you? you? Sorry, you mentioned clause forty it's specific to that clause. Because clause, clause 29 or 39 let me, let me get cover, covered, uh, you know, basically we've been talking about earlier. Is it clause 40 that's the one that causes the... Uh, no, it's the... If you yes, it is clause 40, I think, yeah, is the one that causes most of the problems. Uh, I think there's clause 40 and 41. 40 and 40, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, the, the only point, just to reiterate what I was saying, was that the, the basis of how the housing benefit system has worked, and that's got a similar provision, is, is similar, similar to what my colleague has said, is if a person doesn't know what the rules are, and for example, they may have been sent them and in a document that they've for some reason not read, then they'll be held responsible for that. They'll be held to be reasonable that that person should have known about that particular, that particular thing being a problem. And it's not, and on the basis of that, you could on that test, you've got the potential of criminalising people simply because they didn't read a document properly the whole way through. Now, that seems to me a very, very weak protection to people against what is a, a very significant thing, which is to criminalise them. Thank you. George Adams, you want to come in? Thank you, convener. Good morning. I, I would just like 
to go back to what we spoke about quite at length in the, the first panel, which was my basic question would be that uh, the cultural change that's going to happen with the 15% of the powers that are coming, and in a lot of cases, because of the disability aspect uh, to some of the powers, that's where a lot of your advice will be uh, dealing with at the moment. Do you believe that the cultural change will actually have an impact on the service that you're giving? Because we heard from PCS that you know the whole idea was for them to get it right the first time, and if not, for the system to actually get it, there's still, I understand from a constituency work scope for your own groups as well, but uh, would it change with the devolved uh, side of things, the fact that uh, your impact on your service? Um, Mr. Kevin, do you want to come in first on that one? I think um, I think we would we would hope so in terms of um, of having a having a positive effect on um, both in terms of people's interactions with the system, um, people's ability to um, to receive what they what they're entitled to with um, with much less stress and um, and fuss than than currently is in the in the system. Um, in terms of the um, how the new agency might might interact with um, with um, CABs, um, there's a number of ways that that could be supported. That from um, from for instance, of providing regular opportunities for um, for advisors and the agency staff to to meet and, and to compare situations where we've done that with with DWP staff and job centres. Then it's um, then it tends to be be sort of quite um, quite positive from both sides. Um, potential for joint joint training of agency staff and advice staff um, that um, that would be helpful in in, in building a um, building a, a culture and, and some other some other things alongside that. That um, it, would, it would hopefully have a have a sort of positive effect if um, um, if there there was a, a sort of cultural change within within the agency on on sort of many areas of the system. Mr. So Gas, did you want to come in on that one? Like I think uh, an agency who's setting out its dollars, we want to pay you the benefit to which you are entitled, or we want to give you information about that benefit. That only has to breed uh, a, 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 better, a better culture. However, many of the folk who will be entitled to the benefit are going to be people who are unable to come into an office. The, the conversation that would need to be had with someone to complete a claim over the phone is possibly not going to drill down to the, to the finer detail. Mm -hmm. Within many local authorities, the, the folk claiming the disability benefits are folk who are visited in their own house. And when you visit someone in their own house, you can appreciate an awful lot just from how long it took them to get to the door, the arrangements within their living room. Uh, so what you, what you see and what you hear within the house helps you help that person to articulate the, 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 the circumstances onto a, onto a form. So I don't think we're going to get away from that. The folk who are able to get into an office are probably the, the more able. It's the folk who are unable to get into the office that would still require uh, someone to come out. Now, if they felt that they could contact Sorry the new to agency... I'm trying to say that the difference is between the current DWP uh, position where it's uh, we're told there was a culture of mistrust between claimant and DWP currently. It's more or less the idea is to get the culture so that if they can sort it, there'll still be aspects for yep. uh, advice from yourselves, but I'm talking about their, uh, to get the culture where it's getting it right at the beginning if, when possible, as opposed to the current culture, which is more or less let's just cut the budget any way we can. You know, it's If the culture changes and folk feel confident to pick up the phone to phone the new agency, I was wondering if I'm entitled to this benefit, and the response was, absolutely, this is a benefit that you could qualify for, uh, and then there was the linkages, if the, rec if the person receiving the call recognised, well, you need to be visited in your house, we know now who to contact, and uh, effectively put in place a referral for someone to be visited. Mm -hmm. that, 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 would, that would be great, and so long as the agency doesn't fall into the the, the position where the DWP is, where there is suspicion that uh, if it's set out something brand new from the start, and I think the principles in the Charter might just be the way to, to achieve that. Okay. Can I just add... Just no, I'm just going to ask Mr Hall oh, if right, you wanted sorry. to come in and comment. Do you want to come in and comment? I'd agree entirely with what has been said. The, the, what you're looking at is the, 
what you hope to achieve. Mm -hmm. It's the, the real question is how you actually get the process by which you get to achieve that. I think I think everybody would like a social security system that that we're talking about here today, but it's it's, it's important to look at the, the means to to do that. And uh, certainly some some of the things and whether the, whether this is in the, to degree in the charter or whatever, uh, staff training. Absolutely. The the actual attitude towards the, the frontline staff of the new agency towards the claimants is abs one of the most key points, I would say, that, that you could have. And, uh, I mean, there's uh, again, there's a whole litany of things, but things like waiting times and telephones, for example, is another thing. But all these, all these aspects are lots of small blocks that you need to look at very carefully to actually achieve what we, where we're going to. But at the point where you're achieving if, if it gets there, then I agree with you that there could be huge benefits on the advice agencies because it allows us to concentrate in other areas which we'd, which we'd rather be involved in. Mm -hmm. It was just yes, to exactly. mention, just very quickly, uh, this, when we talked about operating of, I'm going off at a tangent here, but operating of the, the benefits, the Scottish Government have already committed, uh, Mr Gowans, have they not, to uh, the, operate the disability benefits. Uh, but what I would be interested in, why? Because you said that you thought that industrial injuries and winter fuel payments should automatically operate. Can I just, can you explain why you said that? I think in terms of what we, the bill is is something that commits to to uprating the um, uprating the benefits um, benefits annually um, by by RPI. Um. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, so basically, but I'm just asking why you said these specific ones, uh, the industrial injuries and winter uh, fuel payments automatically. Because yeah, that was um, I think what um, I was referring to is the the kind of points I was I was making making earlier on in relation to um, into sort of some of the other things that that could be considered to make sure the benefits keep their value, such as mm -hmm. such as the energy energy costs and. But you are aware that Scottish government's committed to disability benefits. Yeah, yeah, I think we'd like to see that on the face of the, the bill. Mm -hmm. Good okay. Uh, anybody, any other members wish to ask in that great person? Um, well, I just want to thank the witnesses very much, and uh, we'll certainly take on board what you've said. Uh, we are now moving into private sessions to discuss the evidence we've had, so thank you very much.